jiggle around or move, just find your centre. Connect into your breath. Really noticing, becoming aware of felt sense of breath in the body. Letting breath come all the way down into the belly, maybe down into the pelvis, maybe all the way down into the tailbone, into the legs, into the feet. Being aware of your whole body as you're sitting here, still aware of breath, also aware of emerging world, the world of NFTs and crypto, something I've just been diving into in the last six months or so, and discovering there's so much more to it than what I originally thought from reading the headlines. So put together this panel of people who are immersed in it in many different ways so that they can share their wisdom and start to look at how we as a community, a conscious community, can possibly take advantage of NFTs and crypto for community building. Uh, there's many ways to use it, as we'll discover very soon. You guys can still hear me at the back. No, okay, I'm stand up. We've got mics coming, they're on their way. So just to begin, I'm going to get Mark, who's here, to do a little bit of kind of a 101 to make sure that everyone kind of understands a little bit of the basics of NFT and crypto. And then once Mark's done that little 101, I'm going to get everyone to introduce themselves on the panel. And then we're going to flow into a bit of a discussion. I've got a few questions, questions from you guys, and we'll just let the discussion spontaneously arise and see what happens. Um, if you do want to ask a question, what I ask is you keep it quite succinct, right? Rather than talking, 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 like see if you can get your question out so we can keep things moving along, okay? All right, there's plenty of space at the front. Anyone want to come up? I'm going to keep saying that because I know people are going to keep rocking it. If anyone wants to come forward, feel free to come forward.
sell one of my little kittens to you. Okay, so I go up to you, we, uh, we agree on a price, and I hand over my little kitty, and you hand me some money. We went through a value transfer transaction. I didn't really trust you, and we didn't need anybody else. So imagine if I'm a graphic, graphic artist, and I create digital cats. So I Photoshop, I draw cats, and I want to sell you one of my cats. How do I, how do I transfer that cat to you? How do I sell you my cat now? Okay, I can email you the JPEG, but who now owns it? Because I can take 15 copies, you can take 15 copies, and they're all digital, but we can, it's trivial to copy anything. And how do we prove ownership of a digital asset? And there's something called the double spending problem. And ever since the world of digital and the internet came out, Eight, nine, here we go. I'm not going to repeat all that first bit. Okay, so I want to, what I get to? I want to uh, send you my digital cat. Really hard, and uh, it's known as the double spending problem. And some of the smartest minds in the world of uh, technology tried to, tried to solve this for many, many years, and they basically couldn't solve this problem. So the solution is Harold. So Harold also lives on our street, older guy. Salt the Earth sort of a guy, uh, we both know him, I trust him, you trust him. So we ask Harold to give a ledger, a list of digital cat transactions in our street. So when I email you my JPEG of my digital cat and you give me the money, we also ask Harold to write an entry in his ledger. Okay, easy. We have to trust Harold, we have to trust Harold that he keeps a good record, we have to trust Harold that he doesn't come back late at night and um, piss on the ledger, we have to trust Harold that he locks his uh, doors up at night, we have to trust Harold that he doesn't sell the information to Bob, who's selling cat information to people, and we have to trust Harold to not get a bit selfish and think, oh, I, I'm a, I've got a bit of a monopoly on this, this, this thing, I have to charge money to keep the information. So we have to put a lot of trust in Harold. So, the use of Harold, the use of a trusted intermediary, is how our entire global commerce system is built, everything. Right, so we built the system on the fact that we couldn't solve the double spending problem. An interesting thing happened 31st of October 2008, a white paper was released into the world uh, by somebody under the pseudonym of Hitoshi Nakamoto. He, she, they disappeared, doesn't matter. Uh, he wrote a white paper that, solved, that explained how to solve the double spending problem. He, he found a way to, to transfer a digital asset from one person to another person without a Harold, without a trusted intermediary. He not only released the white paper, he also released some code. Uh, and he named that thing Bitcoin, which, and so Bitcoin became this digital asset that showed how this could work. And Bitcoin started to get momentum. And uh, so Bitcoin was the first implementation of what we now know as a, as a blockchain. So what Satoshi did was to bring together these clever technologies, cryptography, gamification, a whole, whole lot of cool stuff, package it together into the thing called, that we now know as a blockchain, Bitcoin was the first implementation of that. So how does it work? And again, I'm not going to go into plumbing, but there's some basic principles that are really useful. Uh, so like Harold's ledger, uh, that's kind of how Bitcoin works as well. It's a ledger. It's a list of transactions. But the Bitcoin ledger is very, very long. In fact, at the bottom of the ledger is Satoshi's first transaction to buy a pizza or something. At the top of that ledger is a transaction that I might do uh, today. So if we've got the the full ledger that we know exactly who owns what Bitcoin in the world today. But the difference between the Bitcoin ledger and Harold's ledger, or our bank's ledger, banks, they do the same thing, they just track transactions. The difference is that uh, uh, the Bitcoin ledger is copied. It's copied in lots of places. So anybody can grab a copy and be part of the network, it's permissionless. And so the cleverness of the system is the fact that it synchronizes uh, between all these copies. So as a new transaction flows in, I give you a Bitcoin, it flows into one computer, then within about, within about 10 minutes, it's gone global. Everybody's copy has been updated, and there are tens or hundreds of thousands of computers can do with this copy. So the fact that it's, and that's called a peer-to-peer -peer network, the database is copied, the spreadsheet is copied. And just that very simple fact don't mean to give it two really cool properties. One, that it's, there's no sensor to it. You can't shut it down. There's no central point. Somebody put to put in jail if you don't like it. Number one thing. And the other thing is it's it's unstoppable. 
it, it's, it's, it, think about it, to, to hack into that system, you have to hack into at least 51% of all the, 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 the nodes in the system, which is basically impossible. So it's this unhackable, unstoppable database. It's also set permissionless, so you don't need to ask to join. Uh, it's transparent, it's open source. So a cryptocurrency is a currency that is controlled by open, transparent mathematics and not by the people, uh, people in the government. So if I give you a Bitcoin, I'm not giving you anything. We're just both agreeing to update this ledger that we both trust holds the source of truth. And Bitcoin was the first example of a fungible token. Okay, well not the first example, the first example of a decentralized fungible token. The one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin, just like one $10 bill is the same as another $10 bill. Uh, okay, so the next chapter in the sort of blockchain story is a young fellow called Vitalik Buterin, uh, the arrival at the age of 19, figured, okay, this Bitcoin thing is cool, but wouldn't it be cool if we could not only decentralize information, so we not only have a, a decentralized ledger of transaction, but we could also decentralize code, so a set of instructions, if this happens, do this. So we can decentralize that code and make that run on this global network of computers, we can do some pretty cool stuff. So that's what he did, he launched Ethereum uh, as, as, a, as a new blockchain, so a sort of second generation blockchain that allows code execution. And what that meant is that anybody could spin up their own token, anybody could create their own uh, sort of cryptocurrency. They wouldn't need to uh, persuade a whole lot of people to run, run computers around the world. They just cut and paste some code, dropped onto the Ethereum code execution engine, and that code would be guaranteed to run as programmed. And that's what we now know as a smart contract, another term to remember. So a smart contract is an automatically executing bit of code. And to understand why that is so fundamental, this is an example. So imagine in, in the current world, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a developer and I want to create a gambling, a gambling website. So I might write some code, you throw a virtual tide, a dice on my website, and, and you might win some money. Now, and I post that on, on an Amazon web server or a Microsoft web server. Now, you probably wouldn't go to my website because you wouldn't trust me. Uh, be going, who's, who's this? He's a chunky guy. I don't, he may be skewing the odds when I roll my virtual dice. I don't trust him. I'm not going to use that website. But imagine if I could encode the logic behind that virtual dice throwing in a smart contract. So it's open, transparent, immutable. Even me, the developer, I can't modify that code once it's on. So when you when you throw that virtual dice, you can guarantee what, what will happen. So if, what that means is you don't need to trust me, the developer, you're trusting the system, the blockchain. So it fundamentally changes the trust relationship. And you swap gambling for banking, Uber, Facebook, our governments, anything. You start to realize that this, this system can potentially uh, we can start to re-engineer a lot of what we know. Uh, so, uh, almost finished. Uh, so Ethereum emerged as, as a second generation blockchain. A bunch of other blockchains have also emerged uh, to do similar things to Ethereum. So there's, there's a, a, a whole market of, of other blockchains here. But in Ethereum, most of the action today is happening on the Ethereum blockchain. And fungible tokens, they tend to comply to a standard called ERC, ERC20. So if you're, if you're using a, 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 an Ethereum-based token, and there are hundreds of them, and there's this wonderful term called a shit coin, uh, because it's so easy to create uh, tokens, you know, everybody does, and a lot of shit coins out there. So you've got to be careful. Uh, but uh, if they comply to the standard, then they can run on lots of different wallets, which you can use on your phone, or you can exchange them in standard exchanges. Uh, shortly afterwards, people then realized, hey, this, this global database, essentially, that everybody trusts, we could use that for something else. We could use that to track ownership of the stuff. If we can encode some uniquely identifiable data into that record and some metadata, that can actually give us a way to, uh, to decide who owns a thing. Okay? And that's now known as a non fungible token. So a token that is unique. It can't be swapped for another token. Remember Bitcoin, I can swap one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin. That's fungible. Non fungible means I can't swap one from the other. It's unique. So what has emerged uh, as, is this sort of market for being able to uh, uniquely identify a thing. Now that thing could be a digital asset, like a sock, uh, or, or a bit of 
digital art, or it could be a reference to a real world thing, like a, a real world painting or a house or anything. And and and, and we can yeah, you know, there'll be lots of discussion about NFTs you know, shortly. But what the exciting bit of it is that it, for the first time we can theoretically have digital property rights. We haven't really had that before. We've had to rely on an intermediary, like a, a game, a game, somebody, a, a company who builds a game, uh, or a government, or, or some other entity. We now have this, this global system to, to, to be able to actually uh, support digital property. And uh, yeah. So, so we now know what Bitcoin is, blockchain, smart contracts, ERC20, non-fungible, fungible, Thank you. Cool. I got inspired, I had a massive awakening, started a business called Lotus, Jewel of the Lotus in Silverdale, some may remember it. From that I went on and created Lotus Essential Oils, brought the Himalayan salt to New Zealand. I've been a serial entrepreneur, but I've been always focused on conscious business, spiritual business, and somehow linking that to money and you know, all the things that we like in the, in the earthly plane, but also to me it's about what's happening in the energetic world and you know, evolving as a humanity. So uh, there are lots more travel to India and that. I um, ended up, uh, Lotus sort of started to fade out. I sold uh, my oils business off and my uh, salt business. And I started researching uh, crypto in 2015. I spent a full year as a complete nerd to um, anything techno. I, I mean, I'm more interested in uh, nature and gardening and, and growing food and stuff like that. But this technical stuff just took my head. But I persevered because uh, I just felt this is the way to go. And um, eventually I started buying Bitcoin in 2016. Started you know, buying, I was probably losing more than I was actually making in those days, sending it to nowhere and all that sort of stuff. But um, it, it's really taught me well, and now I've, I'm probably involved in about 50 or 60 different projects. I've got a lot of crypto across the board, but um, also I'm involved in all sorts of other humanitarian projects, entrepreneurial projects. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about crypto and what it can do uh, to help build community and um, help humanity by protecting our privacy, censorship resistance, having transparency. All these things are possible in blockchain. It's just a matter of finding the right projects, steering clear of a CBDC, and uh, basically going decentralized. Decentralizing everything is what I think. CBDC? Central Bank Digital Currency. Central, uh, CBDC is the programmable money that the government, the WEF, you've probably heard about them. They want you to own nothing and be supposedly happy. Uh, you know, so we, uh, it, like anything in the world, it could be used for positive or negative. And uh, we're in a dual world. It's just a matter of us aligning on the right side of the ledger. I use that pun because, you know, we just got to uh, have the knowledge and, and, and be aware that there's other choices out there and a blockchain is the disruptor of everything. It's going to disrupt from the very top. It's going to disrupt a lot of people at the bottom as well. If we're not aware of what's going on, then we're not going to be able to navigate the So, um, you know, the centralized di digital money and the decentralized digital money and they are like chalk and cheese. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tony Knight. Great. 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 Great.
great. And do you want to give us the artist's perspective and how you got into the film in your team? Great. So my name is Graydon, called Any Toko Toko Moka, called Waita Mata Toko Moana, called Graydon the Hope. Um, yeah, so I'm an artist, I'm a creator, and an entrepreneur. Uh, some of you might know this brand here, Old Organic Mechanic. Usually we'd have the Old Tent, this year we're just taking a, taking a chill. Um, but yeah, my art is based on my identity.
the other things on this panel, the reason why I'm talking to you, is that there aren't that many females in this space. Um, and for me to come up here, the way nervous, it's to really help encourage you guys. <laughs> It's, it's always a roller coaster. Um, 
I've seen everything triple and half, triple and half. So I always have a very long term view on the crypto space. Um, after watching a documentary called The History of Money, where I learned about banks and how they were formed and just the corruption that can go along with it by having these people in power. I guess the thing that I love about decentralized currency is, is the fact that we are in control of our own money. Um, that does give you a lot of responsibility in terms of looking after the security, your passphrases, and, and a lot more that we can go into. But um, yeah, I see decentralized currency and blockchain technology as, as the way to save the future because I don't, I don't think that uh, banks and organizations and um, capitalism does work, but there's, there's a lot of problems with it. And um, having a transparent blockchain technology means that you can see everything that's going on. And yeah, I'm, that's why I'm passionate about um, blockchain technology. And the NFT space just means you can prove ownership of certain assets, whether it's artwork, whether it's your AI brain that you are training to, to do anything, literally limitless intelligence. Um, there's been 20 years of technology in AI and it's reached an apex. And so they say in the future, you can either be owned by the AI or own the AI. And having a, a decentralized, democratically owned AI brain of your own, like Siri, I guess, um, is going to enable us to compete, I guess, in the same space that the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Googles and all these other organizations that are currently utilizing AI technology have access to. Um, right, I'm rambling. Um, yeah. That was epic, Chad. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chad. All right, Mark, we'll go to you for an introduction, and then I can, I've got questions percolating just from listening to all these guys, so I'm sure you might have as well. Mark, you introduce yourself first. Yeah, all right, Chad, we've got to solve the proof of humanity problem first, otherwise the AI will end up owning the AI. So, uh, yeah, it's like that. Uh, yeah, so I've been involved in tech for all my career. I started out life as a software developer many, many years ago, and uh, in the last eight years uh, in the blockchain space, I went to a conference in Queenstown eight years ago and went knowing nothing and spent three days uh, hanging out with some cool people and realised this is much more than a, a currency, much more than a new shiny technology. This was a way to change the world. So I got back and uh, yeah, and we pivoted the company I was running then into a blockchain company called the Rebranded Blockchain Lab. And uh, yeah, so a few sort of highlights over the last eight years. Uh, I became one of the founding members of Metacard Toll Ventures. So we're uh, one of the first uh, DAOs. So I'll talk about DAOs later, but DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So this is an organization that runs on the blockchain. So we started that 20 of us as a venture capital investment company. Uh, we're now 70 people in the US in the city and no bank accounts, no, no finance departments, everything, all transactions are on chain and so we invest in Web3 startups. Uh, I've run two conferences. Uh, last conference I emailed a young guy called Vitalik and he came over, so it's like a weird week with, with the creator of Ethereum showing him around New Zealand and introducing him to politicians uh, a few years ago. Uh, I ran the Blockchain Association uh, and I ran the first university course uh, in the world on DAOs, uh, Vic, uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, a couple of years ago I had this sort of uh, apparition, this awakening, or this, this midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it, uh, and realised I wanted to sort of get out of the, get out of the rat race uh, and end up staying out of my company and realised I had these sort of skills, these passions, these knowledge, these bits of knowledge. One was in the, in the crypto, blockchain, DAO space. The other real area of interest was in the new organizational theories, uh, management theories like sociocracy, democracy, teal, these new ways of organizing society, purpose driven, uh, self managing, all that sort of stuff. I was super interested in that. And then health, human health. I got sick in my 20s, spent 10 years with chronic fatigue, and went on this, this journey of sort of understanding health. So I kind of realized I've got these reasonably unique skills, how can I bring them together? So I went on this journey uh, and started a project called the Wellbeing Protocol, which we're essentially trying to solve a big problem, trying to uh, use Web3, um, yeah, so Web3 is another term for blockchain essentially, but Web3 design patterns, Holoxy, Teal, Ostrom's principles of commons management, uh, feminist economics, you know, there's all these really interesting things. We bring them together 
to build uh, local communities or sort of microeconomic system that supports well-being at, at a local level. So that's the world in protocols. That's been the project I've been immersed in for the last uh, 18 months. That's me. Yeah, big. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thank you, Mark. So we've met all the people, hopefully you have even more of an idea around the NFT and crypto. What I'm really interested in and would love to know from you guys up here is how as a conscious community can people specifically start to use this to create epic things, right? Is there a way to kind of nail it down a little bit in a few short sentences of applying, this is what I'm interested in, how do you apply this in a beneficial way for the community. Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, tell us about DAOs. So decentralized okay. autonomous <laughs> organizations. Right, I'll jump to go on for our DAOs. Yeah, so DAO stands for decentralized autonomous organization. So it's essentially uh, building an organization on smart, on smart contract code. And before I talked about this, this code, if you've got this, this system for executing business rules, then you can put lots of those rules together and create voting systems, governance systems, reputation management systems, fund allocation systems. You can basically do what a, what a company does or a government does, in fact, but you can design it in, in open, transparent uh, code that uh, is unhackable and incorruptible in theory. Now, you need to design that system so that it's fair and inclusive, you know, and so that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing this Cambrian explosion of experiments around how do we organize ourselves better? How do we create better decision-making systems that try and move us away from this hierarchical command and control system that we typically see as the only way to do things? So we can start to build genuine community-based systems that allow anybody to partake in the, in the governance, uh, anybody to build up reputation within that community, and and ultimately work on projects that matter for that community. And that community could be a, when I mean, most of these communities are virtual communities, admittedly at the moment, around sort of certain areas, but what, what we're super interested in the Wellbeing Protocol is how can bring that to actually a physical community. Um, and we ran a trial in, in Cannons Creek, and we got quite a lot of publicity last year, the Cannon Coin Project, where we actually started that process, can we issue a local digital currency to help community uh, come together? So yeah, that's 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 what I think. I guess back to the question: What what can we do? Uh, I think is learn. I think there's lots of learning to do, and and start becoming involved in some of these communities. And typically, you know, there's a Discord, love, love, hated it. It's this tool that you can jump onto and, and you can sort of like Slack or it's an online community tool. Lots of these communities are on Discord or Telegram and you can start asking questions, you can start contributing. And lots of people are earning a living now because these DAOs con control funds. And typically you might put a proposal in to do something, say you do social media or you do art or, or you do something, but you can, so you can actually say, hey, hey community, I, I've got this skill, this is what I can do, this is what I, that's how I'd like to be paid, and that community might vote on it via a transparent system, and your little bit of work might get funded. And yeah, so I've done a whole bunch of stuff in, in four different DAOs where I've actually earned money from that. So you, you can start earning a living in, in that. And if, 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 obviously, if that community, what we want is these communities that have a value aligned, and that's what that's a big opportunity that we can create truly global value aligned communities and the big picture exciting thing is those communities could start to solve some of the big problems the problems that our governments and our corporations uh the capital system is completely failing at okay so i'm going to try and translate a little what you said to make sure i understand what you said so if you set up a DAO, right as a community yep. you basically can decide on the values these are the things we value right as a community and then you set up the logic that determines what happens? Yeah, I mean, the way it's working, and again, this is a new emerging field, what's happening at the moment is there are sort of templates, there are tools that you can use. You know, you don't want to write code and to do this. If you want to use a template, you can actually jump in and use a template system, so you can have a certain governance system. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make decisions by, you know, issuing tokens and number of tokens equates to your voting rights. 
example, or not, whatever, you, whatever template it is, you can just use that. But yeah, but then you can, you know, on a, on a document, on the internet, somewhere you say, look, this is what we believe in. This is, this, if you believe in this thing, come join us. Come start contributing. We'll give you tokens for contributing. Then that gives you government's rights, and you can start voting on stuff, and, and so you can try and, and, and you can grow the stuff. And yeah, and, and we're saying some of these communities are a bit fluffy. I mean, Friends of Benefits is, is probably the best known one, which has grown out of a Discord server and grown up with thousands of people around the world now. I'm not sure they have a strong life purpose, but they've grown and they're doing stuff. Uh, and anybody can join. I mean, you have got to pay quite a lot of money to join that community. And that's one key decision. Do you want to, you know, set the bar, a financial bar? You know, some of these communities are doing that, but you can set, you can really design any community you like. Thank you. Any questions from? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a question around NFTs. Yeah. Yeah, go on. So, questions around NFTs, probably for Grady. So, say your example was say you've got a picture or a mural you're going to sell as an NFT, and it's at an art store. So, say that one, for example. If I went over there and had a nice camera took a really good quality picture of it, and you've also done that and you own that, you sell that. How, how, what's stopping me? from loading that up and selling it to someone. Like, do you hear what I'm saying? Because it's so popular if it's sold as a picture. Do you hear what I mean? Yeah, I hear you, bro. Like, how do you still own that? Yeah, that's something that I'm still trying to wrap my head around as well. Okay. So I think that you guys can speak to that. Okay. Go ahead and really the chair. I guess when, when an artist um, starts creating a brand name for themselves you'll set up a an account on for example OpenSea and you will start creating artwork people won't be knowing about you or purchasing your piece of art unless they know it's your art yes you could take a photo of Graydon's artwork and then load it to OpenSea and try and sell it but Firstly, there would be copyright infringement, so then it would be removed. But people wouldn't be buying from a random person. The, the whole point in them buying the piece of artwork is because they can prove that it's unique and that it is from the original artist. So yes, anyone can still take a photo of that piece of artwork and display it at their house if they wanted to make a print of it. But a lot of the NFT space is about people want to know that they've got the real thing. And so it is um, like the, the Mona Lisa, you know, there, there may be people that will create a hundred copies, I don't know, legally of the, of the Mona Lisa that, that you're allowed to sell. But in terms of it, um, being a purchasable item, that, no one's actually going to buy it unless they can prove that it's the real thing. Otherwise, well, maybe they'll buy it for a dollar. Right. What about some copyrights? You can only change a certain amount before you get to use it. So, like with certain text, something like Sim Set, you change it. So, if you took a Mona Lisa and then you gave her a hat, and it would change the color of her. So, so one probably something, an example that is probably happening right now is with the AI generated artwork. People can type in Mona Lisa and then maybe three other words like space, tears, um, flowers, and the AI will actually create a new piece of artwork on it. Um, I don't know what the laws, laws are about having used the Mona Lisa, but that piece of artwork has been created by you. Um, yeah, there's your answer. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Chad. Um, the, probably one of the most famous NFTs that some of you may have heard of is a work by Beeple, who's an amazing artist, and it sold for $67 million. And people are like, oh my God, how is this little pixel on a screen selling for $67 million? But if you look at the artwork, I went and checked it out. And Beeple, I think it was either 500 or 5,000 days, he did a piece of art every single day for let's just say it was five it was five thousand thank you yeah so we did a piece of art every day for five thousand days so imagine the energy the spirit the focus the love that's going into that and then he took 
those 5,000 pieces of art and created one piece of art. And this is the piece of art that he sold on the blockchain as an NFT and it was auctioned off and it went for $67 million, right? But now when I read that, I'm like, oh my God, no wonder it went for so much money because there was so much energy in there, right? And who knows, the guy that owns it, he's obviously got money to spend and he's got the satisfaction of knowing that all of that energy that this particular artist flowed in, he owns it now, right? So when you're looking at an NFT project, one of the things to consider is what is the energy behind it? As Chad and Holly were saying, who's the team behind it? What's the intention that they're bringing to it? How much love has gone into this? Something else is gonna say there. And do you love the artwork, right? Do you love what it looks like? But I would love to hear, maybe Holly you can speak to this in terms of what do people, if they want to invest in NFTs, what, they sh what should they be mindful of? What should they avoid? What are the traps to look out for? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not standing, but I saw it before. I just come from the full on morning. Just keep the mic. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, okay, so what to look out for, I guess. Yeah, what to invest in NFTs. Okay. So for me, my journey of coming into the NFT project, are we allowed to say names? Kind of, yeah? Okay, Fluff World, anyone heard of Fluff World here? No, no. <laughs> so, um, so what really caught my attention for someone who's quite vulnerable in this space, being a, a woman, where it's quite, a, you know, there's a lot of men involved, is I looked at what um, a lot of the men in this space of the NFT, of this particular project we're actually doing. Um, and the founder of this particular particular project, what got me, Aaron McDonald, is he's um, got 60 startups with over $100 million under his belt. Um, and like Chad had communicated before, 95%, um, you know, not so good. Everyone kind of wants to start an NFT and sell them for about $60 million. That's not the grim reality. Um, what you want to be looking at is you know, what I guess the core values are of the project, how are they being run. Um, Discord was also mentioned. Um, along the way, I've looked at other NFT projects, some of my friends have seen to me. I've looked straight into the Discord, straight into the chat, seeing how the community is, how the, the conversations are. You can kind of get an idea of age. You can also start to get an idea um, this is when you're saying to do your own research, you can also start getting an idea of who are really strong investors, or who are there for potentially I can make quick money, or who are very young, or just don't understand the space at all. And that's where you can do quite a lot of negative, like it was communicated, how there's good and then there's not so good in this space. But it's, it's really finding a project that you resonate with, that you do your own research, you can look and see that they've been dots, so their names always you should know who they are. Um, you've got Twitter accounts, they're active on the Discord, communicate, yep, utility, which means what the NFT, pod, uh, what the NFT actually is going to bring uh, you, but also uh, the company that you're investing in. Actually, just on the utility side of things, so there's there's three mega trends that I'm aware of. One is play to earn games with a gamified decentralized finance. Um, someone else could probably try and explain this because I don't completely understand it. But um, artificial intelligence, um, the metaverse, the open metaverse, preferably. Um, I can't remember the third one. Um, but in terms of utility, some of these, so AI is obviously going to give you a utility of a, of a brain that you can train to do various software things in the future. Play to earn gaming is where you can use your avatars and train them to somehow earn, earn money in a gamified way of decentralized finance. It's all very early stages, so there's a lot of learning. All I would suggest is that everybody just opens your mind to start learning about it and be very cautious in people that push things too hard. Like, 
one thing is if, if something's being hyped way too hard and they've got paid influences that's for me is is a red flag um there's a balance um i've seen too many terms, terms pump and dumps basically people just saying this is going to be huge it's going to be amazing throw all your money in and um and there's no utility behind it and then another term rug pull basically people that come up with a great some great artwork um they may have paid someone else to do it and then they receive everyone's investments um if you can call it an investment um and and then they cut and run which is why it's really important to know the team behind the project thank you chad utility right utility on nfts uh so when the nft project for nz spirit launches when we talk about utility the nft can give you access to things so all the nfts that will be sold in the project will give you lifetime access to nz spirit which means as long as the festival is happening and you own that nft then you get to come to the nf to the festival for free so that's what we're talking about when we talk about utility so nfts aren't just a digital thing on the screen they can give you access to all kinds of things greater when you sell an nft does it give people stuff do you want to speak to that a little just uh, yes so when i when i sell a uh, physical print of my artwork i also have the option of getting a uh, digital nft version of, of that and it's just a, it's a little bit extra and it's a different uh, platform that the transaction takes place on but the person who buys that print then also owns a, a digital copy which is also part of a limited uh, collection which over time is usually with with artists it's only valuable after you've gone right van gogh man his, his work's super valuable and he's long gone uh, so we'll see what happens but you know it's it's a way that artists can also take their work digital like that um, and coming back to your earlier question, Carlia, on um, seeing it happen in communities, how how this can, can help. But I'm involved in a project down in the hut called Mangaroa Farms. Um, anyone from the hut in here? Yo, so yeah, Mangaroa Farms is like a it's an organic regenerative land project down there. We're uh, replanting natives, uh, we're growing organic produce and veggies and there's, there's a growing community of people there and one of the mammoth tasks that they're doing is replanting a huge amount of pine forest with natives and so part of the incentive to get people to come and help plant these trees is they they get an nft to say that they were part of that that operation so we we held a tree planting party last july and we planted about a thousand beech trees in, in place of an old pine forest. And every person that came along had access to a QR code like the ones you'll see around, where they could scan and enter their wallet address, and that then an NFT would get automatically sent to their wallet. Which on various platforms, as you connect your wallet to those platforms, it'll show up in your wallet of the NFT. And so it's, it's a cool way that um, we'll start to see more and more with festivals, with Boy Scouts, with all sorts of things, um, that something called a POAP. Are you guys familiar with POAP? Proof of Attendance Protocol, which is also one of those dark and white things, you know, the social credit system. It's, a, it's all kind of like that, but it's a way that we can see, or people can, you can display um, events and things that you've taken part in, and it will show up as an NFT, or kind of like a badge that you get on a boy or girl scouts band kind of thing. So that was a, that's a cool way that I've seen NFTs helping to create a physical, tangible result of planting trees. So all those people that came and planted trees got their NFT, and they can just use it as their avatar or whatever, or their profile pic. Pick, so I went and did the thing. Potentially, could they then on sell that NFT if someone wanted to buy it? Yeah, like that's so. There would there would be more tree planting parties, and then there'd be a different variation of that NFT, and so people could see, ah, oh, they're an OG tree planter. 
because they've got that OG collection and, uh -huh. and yeah, as time goes on those things could become more valuable especially with carbon credits and things like that being tied to these things so, yeah. Epic, thank you Graydon any questions from the... Just wanting to add, yeah, just wanted to add to that a little bit. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the can you transfer it thing, that's kind of a, a design decision. Do you want your NFT to be transferable or not? That's an important thing. Uh, what I would say, just putting a bit of a cynic hat on it, is a lot of first generation NFT, the headline grabbing ones, 13 million for a bit of digital art or whatever, you know, those things don't have much utility. You can, anybody can see it. So really, these first generation, if you're cynical, they are basically pandering to one of the worst human traits, the, the, the need to show off status and wealth, uh, to be honest. So, but that's, that's, I think we need to get past that and look at, okay, we've got this, this programmable value system, we can build anything we want. So for an artist, we can build in systems that allow them to, 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 to create a, a more direct connection with, with the community. You know, in the case of record, in the case of the music industry, the record labels just have that. They act the, the intermediaries and they suckle the profits out of the system. So, you know, music artists can start to build the following by issuing NFTs. And the other part I was going to make is, you know, what, what Graydon sort of touched on is Pro apps and, and NFTs. It kind of also starts to come into the, the world of digital identity. You know, if I've, I've got a wallet and it has a bunch of Pro apps and, and a bunch of NFTs, you know, if I want to share that with others, others can see, oh, they can sort of get a feel for who I am, you know, and that's, you know, for, for better or for worse, that's kind of the world we're living. We're going to move towards uh, our digital identity being built up of, of NFTs and, and tokens that we own. So that means if someone looks at my wallet, they can see all the parties I've been to? <laughs> Holly, yeah, and I, what I just wanted to touch on, because it, it is this world of, the charity element of what good can be done in this world, but then also that there are assets where you can, because of rarities, make a, a lot of potential money and gains because of the rarity element of that NFT. So with Fluff World, which is our motto, I Fuck the World, in 75 minutes, we raised $1 million, and if you're under Ethereum blockchain, but $1 million uh, for the Auckland City mission, and that was powerful. 75 uh, minutes, $1 million? $1 million. And these ladies are sitting there going, what is going on? The city mission ladies? Yes, and this is just the beginning of this year where we've had COVID, right? And they've had challenges. And so this is where I also want to point out that there are incredible things that can be done for the community, um, as well as for us, for our family and friends, right? Children, future, offspring. That's it. Thank you, Holly. So it's a way to, uh, it's like a conduit for wealth. Right, you can set up these projects and move the money around and funnel it towards the social services that require the money. And I think, Tony, you got something to say around this topic? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not hugely into uh, NFTs, but I know enough about them. But what I'm excited about with NFTs, this is the forerunner to what I call the tokenization of everything. Yeah, uh, this is the... Uh, the beginning of what they call the token economy. So just to try and explain that, if you imagine that every good, every service, everything will eventually have a token attached to it, like a kind of like an NFT. So it won't just be for unique artwork. Eventually, I see um, you know a, a decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer economy coming up as a parallel economy to our existing system. The cat is already out of the bag. The way I see it, the genie's out of the bottle. They cannot stop decentralization because it's growing double the rate of the internet grew in the 90s. So they are trying to control it madly. This is why they, there's, there's some serious stuff going on in America uh, with enforcement. But I, I see this NFT, the peer-to-peer -peer economy, decentralized uh, ID. Um, you know, I know we're all worried about our ID getting harvested. You know, data is the new oil. We, uh, the industrial age is over. You know, they talk, they call it that we're coming into the fourth industrial revolution. But it's, it's really the fourth uh, natural evolution as well. And I believe that with blockchain, with anchoring our data protection and being able to trade amongst ourselves without any intermediary 
in a tokenized economy, we can create a parallel, a parallel economy. A parallel reality is already opening up because you already see that it's, it, there's a divergence in the timeline. So we just have to make sure we're on the right timeline. So I see NFTs as this is just the beginning of a long run of seven to 10 years of massive, massive change. So we have to protect our data now, our information, our, our money, because otherwise third parties are just, they'll just take it. They don't care, there's that coming. So this is what I'm excited about. Thank you, Tony. Hey, smart contracts. We haven't talked about smart contracts from the perspective of the artists, because this is a way that artists, normally, right, as an artist, you create a piece of work, you sell it once. And then if it gets on sold, you don't receive anything after that point in time. So you want to speak to that one, Graydon? Are you, are you putting smart contracts in yours? Yeah, yeah smart contracts. Uh, basically, the, the sequence of events which happen after you purchase the NFT or the token. Um, yeah, I, I haven't got too many uh, smart contracts, but if you have any ideas, let me know. <laughs> okay, I'll speak to smart contracts. So the way a smart contract works is as an artist, you create your NFT and then you put a contract on the blockchain. So when that is on sold, the blockchain reads the contract and it might say 10% royalties to the artist. And then every time that piece of artwork is on sold, 10% of whatever it's sold for goes back to the original artist, right? So if you're an epic artist and your work sells for like a thousand bucks the first time, you make a thousand bucks. And then say that person on sells it for $2,000, you just made another 200 bucks. And then it might sell for $10,000, you just made another thousand bucks in the same artwork, right? I mean, how many creative artists in the room? That, yeah, there's some benefit in that. So any questions from the floor? We've got about 20 minutes left. I have a question regarding taxes. Taxes? Yes. All right, fire it. You get tax after, the, after you sell, you get royalty, but you pay tax back for now, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's still income, right? So as an artist, it's income coming in. And at the moment, Inland Revenue is looking at this space and trying to figure out when, how do you track it, right? Because it's on the blockchain, but they're definitely starting to keep an eye on it. So from my understanding, I'm involved in NFT projects. I've been talking to my accountant. I'm like, so how do we handle the GST on this? You know? So governments are definitely looking at that. I IRD is looking at that. Um, so it's something to be aware of as an artist is to make sure you had a chat to your accountant. Hopefully your accountant's starting to get their head around it. Do you, you how are you doing with that? You wanna to speak to that at all? What do you guys wanna to speak to that is when you take the money out, that's yeah. I think the biggest, I guess, the questions I get back is how easy it is it to get my money back out, right? Um, and so for me, I actually uh, withdrew my first amount of money last week, funny enough, because I need now start taking out my risk. Um, and that it took a wall of two hours to get back into my ASP bank account from my crypto wallet. Uh, it's very quick, very easy. Um, and in terms of tax purposes, I run through an easy crypto where I buy my uh, cryptocurrency. It then gets transferred to a MetaMask wallet where I buy my NFTs. Um, and then I transfer it back out if they haven't lost anyone. Um, and that keeps a record of everything for potential tax purposes, of course. Um, hopefully that answers that question. So technically, I believe you need to declare everything as income. Um, obviously it's a voluntary tax system um, and depending on what you're doing, whether you're trading, it's all transparent, but it's, it's very hard to track. Um, for the majority of people, if you're just wanting to get into crypto for the first time and you're, for example, using easycrypto.com, which is a New Zealand exchange, they will, Give you a quick summary saying this is what you've put in and then when you sell it out they will say this is the income you've made and then that's that's what i gave my accountant um, obviously you could do, be doing a whole lot of other stuff in the background 
which could be very hard to track. There's apps such as Coinly, which is with a K, I believe, um, which can do the tax tracking for you. But it is a bit of a bit of a grey zone. Um, some accountants say anything under fifty thousand dollars is overseas income. So yeah, just talk to your own accountant. Um, it's my recommendation. It does really depend on how much you're playing with, but a word of caution, it is messy and uh, your accountant will probably just look at you weirdly because uh, they, won't, they won't know. There's about five accountants in New Zealand who kind of get this stuff uh, for lawyers. Uh, it's, the, the, the law isn't keeping up, basically. The regulations aren't keeping up. So uh, there's airdrops, there's, there's NFT stuff, there's, uh, there's mining, there's staking, all the stuff that the tax law hasn't really kept up with and yeah so there's risk in there uh, so but all I can recommend is keep records keep detailed records you know, write stuff down on a bit of paper uh, so that if you do need to go deep the IRD audit you uh, you you can at least honestly say this is what happens rather than shit I don't know self-responsibility folks it's all about self-responsibility you have a question sir yeah um, I, saw, I, I looked at the blockchain, it's a really good system of work and so on. You guys may have answered this, but when I look at it ethically at the moment, it's a commodity. I see it as a commodity, not a currency. And maybe that is investigating who that you're dealing with to see that they have ethics. And that's been my reticence to go into it because I see people, they have made X tons, you know, 10X yesterday. So to me, it becomes, at the moment, <clears throat> it is really just a commodity that everyone, of course, wants to be looking at. So, is there a transition where it goes from being a commodity to a currency? And is that in terms of how many people are involved? Uh, with cryptocurrency, the term cryptocurrency is actually uh, a bit of a misnomer in a way because not all crypto are true currencies, not like how our cash works. They are they're actually primarily in the decentralized world, they call them tokens, and they're primarily a crypto asset that has a currency uh, aspect of, in that you can send it very easily. So, um, to me, um, there's also, you know, you've got the NFTs and you've got, but predominantly um, decentralized tokens uh, I think they're going to try and make them a security, and I think genuine global currencies will, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, will probably become commodities. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to regulate all the decentralized into a security. In other words, you're buying it with the hope of making money, like you invest in a share. So it's it's a very very uh, messy, chaotic space right now. Primarily because one of the main tokens out there is being sued by the Securities and Exchange Commission in America. There's a token called XRP, and um, these would there will only be a, probably two handfuls of major proper global currencies, as, as in settlement currencies. Because when you're sending, like if I'm sending New Zealand dollars to Australia, to say or any country, it's got to go through what's called the SWIFT system. And that takes, I mean, it will probably be quicker to get you by camel than to go by swift. Um, but it's converting the New Zealand dollars and then they go and they've got a whole pre-funded accounts. This is locking up trillions of dollars of our wealth is locked up, frozen up in these pre-funded um, Nostro Vostro accounts, they call it. And then when it eventually gets to the US, it gets converted and all of this, whereas with Currencies like XRP, XLM, and there's actually a new messaging standard for banks to handle this, and they're going to choose, there's going to be winners, and they're going to choose their winners, and I think the rest are going to try and knock out. So crypto asset area, to me, is, is the exciting part, which is easily tradable. Um, so we, we, we don't know until regulation comes in, which will probably be later this year, early 2023, 
there is, um, then we're going to see how it's going to be handled and some of those uh, murky areas about commodity, security, currency will get answered because they're going to treat them differently. Yeah, so to just be aware of the current IRD uh, status is that they treat everything as a crypto asset <laughs> And the default is if you buy a crypto asset, you're likely buying it for, for capital gain. So if it goes up, uh, you're going to have to pay capital gains tax on that. So that's the kind of the default on the RD website. But then it gets more complicated. You could, could you argue, well, I didn't, I didn't buy it with the intention of capital gain. You know, so there's all this weird grey stuff. So. Yeah. What about when it goes down? And same uh, well, yes. If it goes down, and, and yeah, you can offset with your tax. But, yeah. How can she avoid a scam? Yeah, we've kind of addressed that a little bit, Holly, but someone else to speak to how to avoid scams. Look, look at the partnerships they're doing, look at who's behind it, make sure they're available out there on the web, a LinkedIn account, our, you know, um, Find out what their use case is, read their white paper, which is a business plan for crypto. Find out what that problem they're actually solving. Look at their past history, um, you know, and look at look at social media, look at all the chatter around it. And and really, yeah, it's just it does take time. You have to know what you're looking for and be able to read some of the code. I mean, I don't mean the actual Code. I mean the code words, there's a whole new language and it does take time. It did take me a couple of years to just get my head around it uh, before I really started to be able to, um, and I did um, you know, lose a fair bit of money because I gave phishing sites, sort of, they hit duplicate sites and you're sending your money to someone else because they put a an extra letter or delete a letter in the web address. Just, um, yeah, utility is the key. We need something that actually is, has got a, a real world use case. So that's what I look for. And the community, look at the community and the size of the community. to a site that looks like it's easycrypto.co.nz but it's actually a phishing version of that so yeah so that's what i recommend if you're like how do i keep myself safe just go to youtube maybe look up crypto kc and find out the security stuff there go with the hat can you speak up yes this is a question for each person on the panel if you could only invest in one token like bitcoin ethereum etc which one would it be and why Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I, I tend to try and learn from whoever is already in the game and they've been in the game because there's a lot of people who think they understand but you know they've just gotten into it um, and so my understanding right now kind of 80% of my holdings and I'm not loyal to any particular coin there's a lot of people that really get stuck on what camp they're in and really loyal to that thing but most of my net worth is in Ethereum at this point um, and then that's about 80% and then 20% I keep for experimenting with other shit coins as they might be called or things like Solana, XRP, XLM, uh, CRO um, and yeah but these are the things that I'm, that I'm interested in too. Uh, yeah, for me, Ethereum is the safest bet for, uh, you know, about to go to an upgrade, they've got the biggest market share, the biggest, most utility, 
So that if you're getting into it, I, yeah, and Bitcoin is controversial because it uses a shitload of electricity, and a lot of people start to react to that now, and they've got no plans to change. Ethereum is transitioning to it to a more energy efficient system. So, but yeah, but then it's really based on your your risk profile. If you want some relatively safe stuff like Ethereum, and then, but yeah, if you go to coinmarketcap.com, you'll see the top hundred, you know, ordered by market cap. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, blah blah blah. You know, out of that lot, there's probably out of that top ten, I'd go shit. There's about four of those which I cannot see why they're there. Uh, would invest in them, but the others are pretty safe. Uh, and then you just go on the list. And the further down you go the list, the more risk you're taking on. They're just smaller projects, less investment in them. Uh, but, Which coin are you now to one? Um, I, I do like um, I do like XRP and XLM, I think because they are going to possibly have the best price appreciation and they're going global and they're, they're integrating the old system into a newer system. So I'd go there, but my second choice, I believe in diversification. I'd go for Chainlink because they are linking all the blockchains together into a, into a giant ecosystem. Uh, when I first started my crypto journey, I split it across uh, to the South Korea and to Lipka and Ethereum. I thought, okay, I'll split it, split it out. And then I then was introduced to NFTs and I was like, okay, well, there's a potential big hype track train. And actually, Weta Workshops is now partnerships with one of our NFTs. So that's pretty big in a, in a nutshell. And it's all under Ethereum. So that I've got all the, I'm 100% it now with uh, Ethereum, and my salary comes in, my little amount of bills go out, um, and it goes all into Ethereum, my, my entire salary. Yeah. And it's investment. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for the, for the beginners, I mean Ethereum is going to be the world's largest computer, basically, um, and yeah, safest blue chip because it's got over half of the cryptocurrencies that will build on it. So yeah, that would be the safest bet. And, um, I love Bitcoin because Bitcoin is fully decentralized, and, but I don't have any anymore. It's all in Ethereum at the moment. So one thing, that the whole market, so which this really illustrates the immaturity and the lack of knowledge generally, if you look at coin market cap, day to day basis, the whole thing swings up in, in unison, you know, even the shit coins. So, and, and it kind of reflects mostly the broader tech investment space. So when the, when the NASDAQ goes up a bit, all of crypto goes up a lot. The you know, NASDAQ and you know, other stock exchanges go down, crypto goes down. So that's kind of, that just shows yeah, the immaturity of the system. So don't think you're really diversifying yourself that much if you're just throwing a whole bunch into that top 100. They're all going to go up sort of often similarly. Uh, so just be aware. And you know, don't, don't, this is still speculative betting. Don't, don't bet more than you can afford to lose. But the whole self-sovereign wealth thing it can be scary. You know, there's no other under number. If you lose your keys or somebody sees your keys with your private thing, uh, they can just they've got your money. There's no complaints, it will just laugh at you. You can't call the call centre. <laughs> there ain't no call centre. You had a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the question was so uh, Bitcoin is obviously the biggest one at the moment as far as value for a coin. And but the thing the problem is that it uses so much energy to mine to create. Is there any and Ethereum is changing? You were saying Ethereum is changing. Yes, the question is the sort of the energy usage of Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Yeah, there's no. Uh, I, I feel they will bow to global pressure eventually, but there's been no noises from the Bitcoin community bowing the switch. So it's switch from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, Ethereum is mid-transition, it's taken longer than they would have liked, but it should happen this year or next year, uh, and the big change is already out there, so they're going through that, and that's a fundamental shift uh, away from this very inefficient system to, to a much more efficient system, so, and all the, all the other blockchains like Solana, they're all already on proof of stake system, so it's kind of a bit of a hiccup in the history of this, the whole energy question. Yes, sir. 
Realize, and this, this is why a lot of people say the whole thing is a huge bonsai scheme. You know, as soon as I own Bitcoin, it's in my best interest to have get more people to buy Bitcoin because it pushes the price up. So, you know, uh, that's just the way. But, but, but that's the same with any, any share. Out of Apple or Tesla share, it's the same thing, really. It's, so, so you've got to be aware of that. Uh, but, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, influencers, paid people. Uh, I think somebody said before. Don't, yeah, that's a real red flag. You know, if, if the project's having to pay people to, to promote and create YouTube videos, then that means that might mean there's a probably project behind the scenes. I don't know. Yeah, we've been very careful with friends who've recommended stuff. That's really, I don't think a lot. Yeah, there was really, um, I've, I've um, been on Spike The Hyperverse? Yeah. Yeah, I, I am in Hyperverse. I've been in it for nine months. Um, I think it's, uh, is, you know, like there's an element of risk in everything, and but Hyperverse has worked for me. I have a passive income. It's a passive, it's a membership reward program. Uh, what they're doing is it's basically a customer acquisition. Uh, there is a referral aspect to it, but they're not, uh, it's not multi-level marketing. It, it requires a little bit more, uh, it's, it's a bit more intricate than that. But I think Hyperverse is on the level, but I think they are going to encounter some headwinds, possibly going forward with regulatory environment. So we've got to remember that. It's, everything is fair game right now, and the regulators will be looking at projects like that. But why I like Hyperverse is just backed by a solid, they've got one of the bigger holders of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and they've got a lot of assets on the blockchain. They own or, own or partly own a lot of exchanges, including Binance. They've got 4% in Binance. So, but you know, be do your own diligence and just, be uh, careful. Yeah, I'm hearing the same message. Due diligence, do your research, be careful, sir. Question. The quickest, the, 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 the beauty of uh, crypto when you're creating the code, you create a limited supply. Hyperinflation is caused by infinite money printing that they can just print money more. They're not even physically printing, they're just pushing a few buttons on a computer. And that flood of money that's going out, all the, you know, when the government were dishing out our, you know, you know COVID passive packages around the world. The money printing has just gone out the gate and that, I think that is one of the main reasons why this system is coming down and uh, the by a good project that is creating a limited supply in, in relation to how much use case it's got. So for something like say AXRP that is a global currency, they could print more supply and it would still be a very uh, good project for the price. See, the price is actually more deflationary in crypto because of that supply limit. So once they are all in circulation and they're not, they can't print any more, that is going to only pull the price up, which means deflation because then you get more bang for your buck. Another 
able to allow for expansion of roads. Down to point, uh, zero point, um, eight, eight decimal points. So they cannot print any more than 21 million. That's fixed. But you do get fractional reserve. So what it means is the little fractions of Bitcoin could get quite valuable. So, particular, so for instance, say having point zero 0.01 of a Bitcoin in say 10 years, if, it, if it's still going then, I'd say it could be worth a lot of money. So they can go deep into value can go deep by fractions and the fraction economy is sometimes what they call it, it it's very valid so it means the price isn't uh, i mean inflation isn't going up you are getting more that's why it's like an asset as well in a sense because you get price appreciation from the more people that are using it metcalf's law says that the value of a certain technology is reflective of how many users are involved in it and when regulation comes and it hits mass adoption it then then it's who knows where it's going to go but the the law of Metcalfe's law will really start kicking in when institutions as well as us retail people get in get on board it's going to be exponential i believe once that trigger is pulled. Down to Chad. We're going to wrap up very soon. Let's hear from you first, Chad. Yeah, I mean, for me, in, in regards to that gentleman's question about his friend saying, oh, you know, you should get some crypto. Um, um, my non financial advice recommendation is, is if you've got 1% to 5% of your net asset, putting it into something like Bitcoin or Ethereum with a long term 5 or 10 year view. That's my view of <clears throat> hedging against inflation and the current banking system. That was my view. And so when, I, um, when I've got friends that ask about crypto, I normally just say, look, just touch a little bit into Ethereum, a little bit into Bitcoin, start there and don't trade. Like all my friends that tried trading, uh, have lost their money. So I would always, that's one big thing is don't trade. And the next thing is, is with the NFT space, do not trust anybody at all in Discord because there's scams that are so legitimate that they look like the real thing. If anyone direct messages you, it's not real. So you just have to talk to people that you know and trust really well in the community and go from there. Um, yeah, find a good community. And I guess if NZ Spirit is starting an NFT project, then I'll be able to hook in all of my pieces of knowledge. Mark, all, all of these people will be able to put in their favorite contacts or websites or channels to listen to and you can just start educating with the best step. Education, education, education. Well, well I actually have, we uh, have a business called DeFi Freedom and that's what we do. We educate people. We even have a free option so people to dip their toes and get, get used to it without having to pay. We um, we do a lot of presentations. We look we present on the spiritual aspect as well as uh, the humanitarian aspect as well as the how to's why would you want this over there and yeah we're not financial advisors but you know but we are we are crypto researchers and we're actually life researchers with uh, a fair amount of experience in our team so if you're interested I've, we've got a flyer you can get a discount off the membership if you wanted to get paid and we do one-on-one consults you know we've got a whole platform so if you're interested awesome. thank you tony any last words from anyone on the panel before we wrap up just really following up on the general question about the uh, sort of inflationary policy. I think the key thing to remember, you know, we're we'll talking about Bitcoin as an investment currency is just one small bit of the blockchain world. Uh, the reason Bitcoin has value is because it has an open, transparent monetary policy. We know exactly how much is being mined, how much is going to be mined in the future. That's encoded in maths. We can, we can look at the code, and we can look at the code. So, it's, and it's, it's inherently uh, deflationary, uh, but it's, it's governed by uh, sort of 
unlimited uh, sort of uh, supply and demand. So if, if somebody, if Elon Musk tweets that Bitcoin's awesome, the price goes up and it's crap to go down. So that's, it's, that, that's what happens. So that's that's just that's the reality of a of a sort of relatively new still new cryptocurrency. Uh, and yeah, the other bit of yeah, if, 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 yeah, stage one might be just buy some Bitcoin or some Ether. Stage two, you know, we haven't mentioned DeFi, but DeFi decentralized finance. There is this whole world of financial products out there, so I can I can stake my Ether into into a fund and I can earn interest, or I can convert to a stable coin, US pegged stable coin, Tether or USDC, and I can earn eight percent interest. Way better than what we can earn here. The risks are harder to quantify, but that, that system, because uh, you know our banks don't really care about the people who don't have much money. This system can support anybody. Uh, you know, so you can you can invest very small amounts, earn small amounts of interest, but you can play in that world and you can skip through the entire current banking system and, and make money. So, thank you, Mark. Be your own banker. Be your own banker. Any final words? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'll just quickly speak to the artists. If you are interested in getting this back into the space, um, OpenSea.io is a platform that you can host NFTs and it's an Ethereum based uh, platform. And the only thing about OpenSea and the, the Ethereum thing is that when you're moving funds around, you have to pay something called gas fees, which we might have touched on, but it's really expensive to move Ethereum around at the moment. So you can also look on other platforms like Solana has some really good artist uh, portals where you can upload your, your work and it works on the Solana blockchain. Um, and also MetaMask Wallet is something to look into as well. Anyone got a MetaMask in here? Cool, yeah. Um, and yeah, gparker.art is where you can see some of my artwork. And yeah, keep keep a lookout for the um, Indian Spirit NFT collection. That would be pretty cool. And yeah, thank you so much, Carolia, for, for holding this space. And to the fellow panelists, I've actually got a cruise off right now to another hosting a, a mentor shop just over here. So if any, any bros want to come along for that. Highly recommend that for the men in the room. Follow Graydon out once you've finished here, of course. <laughs> yeah, but do you guys want to close up with it? Obviously, it's brought on to this panel for a reason, and it's for the women in this space. So, are there any women here who do not currently have crypto or any NFTs, but they've got this gut feeling that they need to get into it? Yeah? Cool. Now's your time to shine. Find your person that you trust. Find your person that can help guide you and do it sooner than later. That would be my, my bit of advice, but not financial advice. Um, but please, uh, like I've said, crypto is historically very masculine. Um, the NFT culture now, however, is full of creatives now realizing how powerful the space can be. And it's becoming more inclusive and there are a lot more whiteies coming in into that journey as well. So yes, it's, it's for everyone. Um, but you've just got to make it happen. Because I meet a lot of women uh, who come to me for guidance and help, um, and I do help them, but then somewhere they can get a little bit, I guess, um, distracted with other forms of their life. Um, and they're like, oh, why didn't I do it then? Um, and it's something where you've really just got to get your head around it, follow your intuition a little bit more, and just get it done. Um, and then once you're in it, and once you're really got your wallets, you've you connect it and invest it a little bit, it'll start to tip over a little bit more and you'll start to understand it bit by bit. But the sooner you can get yourself in, because this is why you're here, the, the quicker you'll be able to get on that journey. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. So, Holly, we're going to be hanging around if anyone wants to come in and have a chat to you after, like just over there. Cool. Epic. All right, thank you so much to the panel for sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge. Good. If you're interested to, in being on the whitelist for the NZ Spirit NFT project, which is coming soon, there will be NFTs with utility, lifetime access to NZ Spirit Festival. There's only going to be a hundred of these, so jump on the whitelist. There's QR codes up around this place. Um, if you have any questions, anyone here on the panel might be hanging out over here. Come have a chat to them. Otherwise, have an absolutely epic festival. I would like to see you on the dance floor later on tonight. Thanks for coming, everyone. Woo!